We're going to talk in this chapter about, I think, what you got on tap this week in lab, which is chemical equations, chemical reactions. So we're going to start with really chemical equations, and then we're going to uh, talk about different ways to classify reactions. And that hopefully should put everybody in good shape for this week in terms of lab. So let us get started. Um, so first off, uh, when we deal with chemical equations, which really represent the chemical reaction that is taking place, uh, there's a couple of really important things. First off, we should always have a balanced uh, chemical equation. So if you're ever using an equation, uh, you do want to make sure it's balanced. And that really has to do with sort of conservation of mass. We don't really lose any elements along the way in a chemical reaction. So as we talked about when we talked about sort of atomic number and those type of guys, protons, electrons, and neutrons, in a normal chemical reaction, it really is just the electrons that are involved. So we really never change any of the protons. And because we don't change the protons, that means we do have conservation of the elements from kind of left to right there on the equation and in the reaction. The only thing that really happens is everybody breaks apart all their bonds, which is really the electrons kind of get together and they really reassemble on the other side. So if you started with like six carbons on the left-hand side, you should end with six carbons on the right-hand side. Uh, the only difference is they will probably be in different sort of compounds and stuff like that as a result of a chemical reaction that takes place. So what we see up on top is a balanced chemical equation. Um, it is balanced because if we pretty much add up all the elements on both sides, they're the exact same amount. So if we just simply look up here for our hydrogens, there are two times two is four on the left, two times two, which is four on the right. Uh, there are two oxygens on the left. This two also gets distributed to the oxygen in the back and that gives it two oxygens on the right-hand side. So that is a balanced equation. Um, if an equation is given to you, you should always check to make sure it is balanced. And if not, you should probably balance it. Um, we'll talk about how to do that in just a second. But let's talk about some of the different parts of a chemical equation. Uh, there's really two parts. The first part is what we find on the left-hand side of the arrow. And those are our reactants. So the reactants in a chemical reaction are really your starting materials. So they're basically what you start with. Uh, they're the guys that basically are going to break apart all of their bonds and go to the right-hand side here of the equation, which are the products. So the products are obviously the stuff that is formed as a result of the chemical reaction that has taken place. Reactants on the left, products on the right. Now there's other things that we very commonly will see in a equation. Uh, we will sometimes see the states written like next to everybody, an S for solid, an L for liquid, a G for gas, and an AQ for aqueous, which basically means that water environment, it's a solution and it's typically made by taking something like say salt and dissolving in something like water and you make a solution that is aqueous. And that is the difference between a liquid and something that is aqueous. A liquid is just a pure uh, substance by itself like water. If you just had water, that is a liquid. If you take water, like I said just a second ago and take some sodium chloride and you basically dissolve them together you will get a sodium chloride solution that is aqueous. So uh, there is actually a difference between those two things. Other common things that we do see when we look at a chemical equation, a lot of times over the arrow, we will sometimes see things written. Uh, sometimes we may see a little delta symbol that usually means heat. We may see, you know, something like, uh, platinum or some other type of metal written up there. And sometimes what those are are catalysts. And a catalyst is <clears throat> something that is added to a chemical reaction basically to speed up the chemical reaction. It's not a reactant, it's not a product. It actually does not actually get used up in the reaction. It is really there just to facilitate, in most cases, that reaction occurring a lot faster than it would if you didn't put it in. Uh, so that's why sometimes we see it up on top of the arrow. Sometimes catalysts are metals. Sometimes catalysts are things like acids. So you'll sometimes see something like H plus written on top of the arrow and so forth. Um, 
another common thing that we sometimes will put on top of the arrow is something like water. And usually if you see water on top of the arrow, that usually means that you're taking something that's solid and you're dissolving it in water is usually, you know, what that would sort of represent. So sometimes the equation will show us a lot of things, um, but main components, reactants on the left, your starting material, products on the right. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So let's talk about some steps to balance equations. And these are just some steps along the way to do it. Uh, first off, you, you may be given uh, a reaction or an equation that's all in words. So if you are given things that are all in words, the first thing you really wanna do is make sure that you get all the correct formulas down correctly. Um, so you wanna think about like we talked about with naming, uh, you know, get everybody down the correct formulas first, and then you want to balance. Although that may seem like a, a very easy concept. Uh, sometimes people really struggle with that, and they oftentimes will struggle with it when they are given the reactants and are asked to sort of provide the products. So very often, if they're sort of given the front part of the equation and asked to sort of provide the correct formulas and balance the equation on the right-hand side, Oftentimes people will kind of uh, try to balance and write the equations at the same time. And what usually will happen is you'll end up with the wrong equation. The thing will never balance. So if you ever are in that situation, which sometimes occurs in lab as well, I think that you got like an arrow and you guys supposed to supply what's on the other side there. What you want to do is first make sure you get all the correct formulas down. Forget about the balancing part. Just want to get all the correct formulas down and then you want to balance. So that's sort of the process that you want to do there. Once you have all the sort of correct formulas down, that is what is sometimes considered as your unbalanced equation. The next really important thing is uh, we want to balance it. You know, whatever seems easiest to you might be good. Sometimes the more complicated guys are good ones to start with. But the important part is when we balance the equation, the only thing that we can change are the coefficients. So that is the only thing that can change. Those are the numbers that come in front of the formulas. You never change the little subscript because then you change what it is. You never put like numbers between elements or anything crazy like that. So it's really only the numbers that come in front. And really the goal is, and most people do sort of a trial by error, put a number on this side, then kind of put a number on that side until everything sort of balances. Once you do that, you hopefully have balanced the equation the last thing you want to check is to make sure that everything uh, is balanced. You have the same number of elements on both sides of the arrow. When you have properly balanced equation, there's really two things that you should have. First off, you should have all whole numbers. So for those coefficients, they should all be whole numbers when you have properly balanced the equation. Not only should they be all whole numbers, but they should be the simplest set of whole numbers. So what I mean by that is if we balance an equation like 2a plus 4b goes to 6c, and we'll just assume that this is balanced. And if this was balanced, we can look at all those coefficients and we could actually go through and divide everybody by two and still get whole numbers which means this guy that I just wrote would not be the properly balanced equation. You would want to go through and kind of reduce down all those numbers to like A plus 2B goes to 3C would be the proper one. And this sometimes happens because sometimes people can see maybe larger numbers than other people can see. And you can definitely balance an equation with bigger numbers, uh, but you do want the simplest set of whole numbers when it's all said and done and all the coefficients do have to be whole numbers. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. So let's take a look at one here together. So really when we look at an equation such as this, it is sometimes very helpful to make a table to kind of point you in the right direction. And what I mean by that is you could have a reactant side and a product side. And you basically have nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen sort of involved here. And in this case, on the left-hand side, we see for nitrogen, there is one nitrogen right there. On the right-hand side, we have two nitrogens. 
On the left-hand side, we have uh, one oxygen. On the right-hand side, we have one oxygen, which is right there. And on the left-hand side, we have two hydrogens. And on the right-hand side, we have two hydrogens. So by making this table, we could clearly see that everything's looking pretty good here, except for obviously the nitrogen. So that makes a very good place to start. To do this again, we need to put the number in front, which is a coefficient. We would put a two in front of the NO. When we do that, we have now changed the left-hand side. We now have two times one, which is two nitrogens. That two also gets distributed to the oxygen, which would be technically two times one, which would give me two oxygens. We still have two hydrogens. And very much what happens when you go to balance the equation is you fix one thing and kind of screw up something else. But that's okay. We have our table here, which then tells us probably the next best place to go fix would be our oxygen on the right. We have two on the left and only one on the right, which means we could put a two in front of the water here. When we put the two in front of the water on the right hand side, we have two nitrogens. Oxygen, again, the two gets distributed to both guys that are here. So that is two times one for the oxygen, which is two. And now for our hydrogen, two times two, which is four. At this point, we're getting really close. We've now fixed the nitrogen, we refix the oxygen. The last thing that needs to be fixed now is the hydrogen. So we wanna go back to the left-hand side here. And we basically wanna add a two there as well. And that's gonna give us two nitrogens, two oxygens, and two times two would be four for our hydrogens. This would represent the balanced equation. And I'll just rewrite it down here. We have all whole numbers. We have the simplest set of whole numbers. We have the exact same number of elements on each side. Any questions on those steps? Yeah, you can, uh, just for our purposes here, we're just balancing, you, you can translate those down, yeah. And you, you, you especially should if it says to uh, include the states in, in a question or something like that, like write the balance equation, also include the states, uh, you should do that. Um, but for our purpose here, we're just kind of balancing at this point. Other questions? Okay, then why don't you try one here, I find it. There it is. All right, give that one a go. Take a minute or two. Okay, let's take a look and uh, see how we're doing. Um, <clears throat> so just make an opening table. Again, just sort of helped you orient uh, where you might want to start. So carbon on the left there, we have uh, three. Carbon on the right, we have one. On the left-hand side, hydrogen, we have eight. On the right-hand side, we have two. Oxygen on the left, we have two, and oxygen on the right, we have three. Again, two here and one more over there. So that's a grand total of three on the right-hand side. At this point, we really don't have too much balance. So probably you could look and see the easiest thing maybe to start with would be perhaps a carbon. We got three on the left, we have only one on the right. We could pretty much remedy that by putting a three in front of the CO2. When we put a three in front of the CO2, that gives us now three carbons. We still have two hydrogens. Now with that three there, we're up to three times two, which is six oxygens, plus one more over here gets us a grand total of seven oxygens at this point. Any questions on that so far? We fix the carbon, probably again, looking at it, the next easiest thing to fix would be the hydrogen. The oxygen, as we can see, is in a couple of different places on the right. So, you know, hydrogen is only in one place. So that might be a much easier approach. We could simply fix the hydrogen by putting a four here in front. And if we put a four in front, we end up with, again, three carbons. Again, in terms of our hydrogens, four times two would be eight. Now our oxygens are still three times two in the first one, but now we also have uh, four times one there in the second one. That's a lot of math there, but I believe that should be 10 when we're all added up together. 
At this point, we could very easily fix the oxygen by going to the left-hand side. And again, we just need to put a five there. That gets us a three, that gets us an eight, and five times two would give us a 10. Again, uh, we end up with C3H8 plus 5O2, three CO2 plus four waters. Any questions on any of those steps? Again, you can see the only thing I changed was coefficients. None of the small numbers. Also, never put a big number in between things like that. Um, so, only the front numbers. Any questions on that one there? What is that going down between? It could be really high. I don't know who asked that, but it could be. It could be really high. <laughs> um, you know, you got like thirty. It could be a really high number sometimes. Yeah. Is this only the correct answer, or is there another way to? Okay, so the, the, this is the correct answer. You could, for example, we could have, uh, you know, for example, went with uh, this. And if we look at this equation, I was just say, for example, we, we chose these numbers here. If I did it right, we should have uh, six carbons on the left, six on the right. Uh, two times eight is 16 hydrogens. Eight times two is 16. 10 times two is 20 on the left. Uh, six times two is 12, plus another eight is 20. So it is balanced, but it is not correctly balanced because if we look through those coefficients, we have a two, we have a 10, we have a six and we have an eight, which means it's really not the simplest set of whole numbers. So this is what I was talking about before. You can pick as many big numbers if you want to balance it. But when you're correctly balanced, you do need to get it down to the simplest set of whole numbers, which is what we have in the box. You technically could get there by dividing everybody here by two, right? And it will get you down to what we actually ended up with. So it does happen sometimes people again maybe see some different numbers or bigger numbers and stuff like that so when you feel you have balanced the equation you just want to take that extra step just to make sure that you cannot reduce down all of the coefficients by a common number and still get whole numbers so in this case on the bottom although technically it is balanced it would technically be incorrectly balanced because it's not the simplest set of whole numbers and yeah, no problem. And to answer the other part of that question, I've seen ones where, you know, you got like a 35 or something as a coefficient, so you can get pretty big numbers you know, sometimes as well. Other questions on that? <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh before we did before we uh finished it up right uh so uh we we had 10 when it was all said and done yeah. so and if we just look for example just the water part right here and then on the we have the three co2 right so the question is about the oxygen sort of what we would end up with so you do have to take the coefficient times the subscript in this case so on that guy that would give us a grand total of six oxygens right and then this technically would be four times one, which is technically what the, the subscript there is. That would give us another four oxygens and the other guy. So grand total, 10 oxygens on the right-hand side, uh, six and one and four in the other guy that's on the right-hand side. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a coefficient, you got to distribute it to everybody that's behind the coefficient uh, when you're kind of counting up how many you have. Other questions? Yeah. Those are just the states of, of what all those are. They're all in the gas state, I think, in this case. Uh, the, and one's a liquid. It doesn't have anything to do with the balancing. It's just telling somebody, for example, the water's in the liquid state while the CO2 is in the gas state. Um, and those are very commonly sometimes seen in equations as the states, but it will really have no effect on the balancing part. Other questions? Yeah. Exactly. 
It, it does. And that's why sometimes the table is really helpful to make because it kind of points you maybe what number is your goal you need to get to uh, by doing the table kind of like what I was doing there. You know, before when we first started, we had three carbons on the left and only one on the right. So the table tells us, well, we could get to three easily by going to the right hand side and putting a three there. So the table really helps you sort of help narrow down what numbers you might want to try. Yeah. Other questions? And in a lot of cases, you know, you kind of put a number on one side, go to the other side and kind of go maybe back and forth. Uh, sometimes you do need to maybe put numbers on both sides to start with, but, um, you know, it's a kind of back and forth trial by error is usually a common one. So why don't we try another one here? All right. So give that a go, see what you come up with. Do our table here to begin with. On the left-hand side, there are two borons. On the right-hand side, there are one. Left-hand side, in terms of oxygen, we have three here and one more here, which gives us four. Now, in terms of the oxygen on the right-hand side, we do need to take this three and distribute it to both of the guys that are inside the parentheses. Uh, so that would give us uh, three oxygens there. On the left-hand side, we have two hydrogens. And on the right-hand side, we also distributing that three, we'll have three uh, hydrogens. Not a lot to work with here. So since boron's hooked up to everybody on the right-hand side, might as well start with boron. And we can easily balance that by putting a two in front of it. Very badly written two, but a two nonetheless. There we go. When we do our two over there, uh, we also will have now two borons on the right. We distribute the three, but we also will need to distribute the two as well that comes in front. So that's basically three times one for the oxygen, which gives me three. Three times two is six for the oxygen. Same thing for the hydrogen. Three times one is three, then ties it by the two in the front. Also gives us six over here for our hydrogen. Any questions on that so far? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, uh, this is what we got going on on this side, right? So uh, we basically got to take uh, three times one, which would give us three. And then we also need to multiply it by the number in front. So that would be three times two, which gives us six. And the same thing would work here for the hydrogen, three times one. And then also got to multiply it by the number in front as well. Other questions on that? <clears throat> So obviously we can't do much with the right-hand side at this point, since we already put a number, you don't usually wanna go back and start changing your numbers unless you screwed up. So in this case, we should go to the left-hand side and probably the easiest thing to solve for would be the hydrogen. Again, we have oxygen in a couple of different places on the left. Uh, so to fix the hydrogen, we just simply need to put a three in front of the water. So we'll put a three in front of the water. When we do that, on the left-hand side, we have two borons. On the left-hand side, we have three oxygens there. We also need to distribute the three back here to this guy. Three and three give me six oxygens. And three times two gives me six hydrogens. In this particular case, by putting that three, it actually took care of both of the things that we needed. Took care of the hydrogen and oxygen. And sometimes that does occur. Sometimes things just sort of fall into place after you put a few numbers up on the board. Any questions on this one here? Yeah. Can you redo that um, second part that we asked to the three to the H2? Like why we added the three, is that your question or? Yeah, so uh, before we did that, we had, this right so at this point uh we had on our table we had two we basically have this side we had two uh borons six oxygens and six hydrogens and we had four oxygen on the left and two on the uh, left for hydrogen so between oxygen and hydrogen, because oxygen was in a couple of different places, it was much easier just to start with the hydrogen part. So we basically, if we just kind of look back here, we had two on the left and six on the right. 
So basically to fix that, we just simply need to put a three in front of the hydrogen on the left. And that would give us three times two, which would be six hydrogens. Now that also fixed the oxygen for us by doing that because we ended up with three oxygens here and then distributing that three to that oxygen as well gave us three more oxygens. So that was a grand total of six oxygen that we also needed in this particular case. And again, that sometimes happens when you uh, put a number down. Sometimes, you know, it'll take care of more than one thing. And that's sometimes a good thing. Other questions on that there? <clears throat> You're welcome. All right, let's try another one here. How about uh, this one here? Give it a balance, see what you got. You're doing. Uh, so on this one here, left-hand side, we got one nitrogen. Right-hand side, we got one nitrogen. That looks good. Left-hand side, we got uh, three hydrogens. Uh, Right-hand side, we got two hydrogens. And finally, left-hand side, two oxygens. And we also have two, again, one in each of these locations here uh, for the oxygen on the right-hand side. So seemingly it doesn't look too bad. We got everything balanced except for hydrogen. We got three on the left and two on the right. In this particular case, common number between three and two is six. So in this case, we might want to actually add some numbers to both sides to get us there to six. To get the hydrogen on the left to six, we do need to put a two in front. To get the hydrogen on the right to six, we do need to put a three in front of it. When we do that, we've now changed everything. So let's take a look at the left-hand side. We now end up with two nitrogens. Again, distributing that two to the three for the hydrogen, two times three is six. And we also end up with two oxygens on the left. Right-hand side, uh, we still got uh, one nitrogen. Uh, in terms of hydrogen, also distributing the three times the two gives us the six. And in terms of oxygen, we still have one here, but we do have to distribute the three to the oxygen over here. So that is three and one is four oxygens, bless you in this case. At this point, uh, we clearly have messed up everything but fixed the hydrogen, which again, sometimes happens. At this point, I would probably go with the next easiest thing to fix since oxygen is a little bit all over the place on both sides. Nitrogen seems very easy to fix here. And we can do that by simply putting a two on the right-hand side. By putting a two on the right-hand side, that gives me two nitrogen. That still gives me three times two, which is six hydrogen. Oxygen, we are now up to, again, the two times the one gives me two in the first guy, and the three times the one gives me three more. That's a grand total of five at this point for the oxygen. Any questions up to this point? At this point, we clearly have laid up numbers into each spot except for the oxygen on the left. So that is probably where we want to go. Uh, we need to somehow turn the two into a five. Uh, so we could turn the two into a five a couple of ways, but the easiest way is actually we could use a fraction to help us do that. Now we could definitely use a fraction to help us do that. And you may be asking yourself, well, how do I pick the fraction? It's a very simple sort of formula. The number that goes up on top is the number you need. So in this case, we need five. So I'm gonna put a five up on top. The bottom number will always match this number here. So this number is a two. So I'm gonna go with a two in this case and use five over two. When I do that on the left-hand side, I end up with two nitrogens. I also end up with two times three, which is six uh, hydrogens. Now what I end up with is basically five halves times two. Those two cancel and I end up with five oxygens in this case. This equation is technically balanced, but it is a correctly balanced equation. All said and done, the coefficients need to be whole numbers. So this very good example that you absolutely could use a fraction to balance an equation. And sometimes you need to do that. A lot of times when you have an element by itself, like a diatomic guy on the left and a couple of those guys on separate on the other side, that sometimes happens. So we do need to actually clear the fraction. So to clear the fraction, we actually need to take the entire equation and we need to multiply it by the denominator, the guy on the bottom, two. And if we distribute that two all the way across here, we end up with four NH3 
plus five half times two is five oh two goes to two times two which is four and oh and three times two which is six h two o and if i did not screw up here 50 50 chance we should still be balanced so let's take a looky here we got four nitrogens on the left on the right we got four which is good we got four times three which is 12 hydrogens on the left six times two is 12 on the right and five times two is 10 oxygens on the left we have four oxygens on the first one and six in the second which gives us 10. so what's in the box would be the properly balanced equation you could absolutely use a fraction to balance the equation, but you do need to get rid of the fraction when it's all said and done. Again, the fraction that you need to choose, number you need on, on top, and matching the subscript on the bottom, basically, and that's your foolproof recipe for picking the right fraction uh, that you need. Any questions on that particular one there? All right, let's try a couple more here just to make sure. All right, so why don't you do Calcium nitrate here. Uh, try that one. Try this one. And lastly, try this one. All right, take a few minutes to come up with. And <clears throat> now, in these equations here, at least the first two, you can recognize something, for example, that we do have a lot of polyatomic ions. So we got like nitrate on that side, we got nitrate on that side, we have sulfate on this side and sulfate on this side. And when you do have equations you wanna balance that have these polyatomic ions in it, sometimes it's a little bit easier to balance the polyatomic ions as like units rather than go element by element. Because obviously with polyatomic ions, as we talked about, you got parentheses, got to be multiplying in a lot, multiplying out a lot. So sometimes it's a lot easier just to keep them together and sort of balance them. So if we take sort of that approach with this, we could start with either one, but I'll just start with the sulfate. On the left-hand side, the SO4, I have one unit of sulfate. On the right-hand side, I have basically three units of sulfate. I could fix that by simply just putting a three in front of the sulfate. That then gives me three sulfates on the left and three on the right, which is good. That immediately impacted calcium and it gave me three calciums on the left. And that then tells me I probably should go to the right-hand side and fix calcium next. And I could do that by putting a three in front of the calcium on the right-hand side. That now fixes the calcium, but this calcium on the right is hooked up to the nitrate. Three times two is six of the nitrates. So I could finish up by now going to the left-hand side. And on the left-hand side, I have three nitrates and six on the right. I could fix that by putting a two in front of it. That then gives me two nitrates on the left and two on the right, gives me two irons. And lo and behold, that is the number I needed to balance out the iron. And we are now balanced. 
it's a lot faster if you keep those guys together, especially if you got polyatomic ions on both sides. It's a lot less error probably going to happen, a lot less multiplying in and out. Any questions on that approach there? So we're going to do the same approach here. Again, we see some polyatomic ions. Phosphate is the same on both sides. We also see carbonate. CO3 is the same on both sides. In this case, we see that the phosphate, we have one on the left and one on the right. So that's good. No need to play with that, right? At this point, we see that we have three of the carbonates on the left, only one on the right. So I could fix that by putting a three in front of the carbonate on the right. That gives me three carbonates on the right, three on the left. By putting that three in front of the silver, that now gives me how many silvers? Six. So that's where I should go next. On the left-hand side, I got three. So I could fix that by putting a two in front of it. That then gives me my six silvers I need. But that two that went in front of the silver will also impact now the phosphate, right? Giving me how many phosphates? Two. And that's where I should go next, back to the other side to phosphate. And I should finish it by putting a two in front of it, giving me two phosphates and how many aluminums? which is good because that's what I needed, right? And it usually, if you kind of keep these together, these phosphate, oh, these phosphates, if you keep these polyatomic ions together and balance them as units, eventually at some point, everything will sort of fall into place if you sort of do it correctly. You could definitely go element by element, but there's a lot more room for error, especially dealing with those polyatomic ions because there's a lot more, you got to distribute the number and the parentheses and those type of things. So it's much, much easier if you've got polyatomic ions that look the same on both sides, just to keep them together and balance them that way. Any questions on that there? All right, looking at the last one here, reactant side, product side. We got uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. We have four carbons on the left and one on the right. We have 10 hydrogens on the left and two on the right. Oxygen is two on the left, oxygen on the right, two there and one more there gives us three. Again, here, probably the easiest thing to fix off the bat is going to be our carbon. We could do that by putting a four. When we do that, that gives us four carbon, gives us uh, still two hydrogens. Now oxygen, four times two is eight, plus one more here gives us nine for our oxygen. The next easy thing to fix since oxygen is in a couple of different places there on the right is going to be our hydrogen. We have 10 on the left and two on the right, which means we could simply fix it by putting a five in front of it. And that gets us four carbon, uh, five times two is 10 hydrogens. Oxygen, we now have eight still in the first and five times one is five. So eight and five is 13, I hope, yes. At this point, we have a similar situation. We clearly don't wanna play with any of the numbers on the right. So the only thing that we could go with is over here. And to do that, we would probably wanna again use a fraction here. Again, the number that we need would go up on top, which in this case is 13. The number that matches this number would go on the bottom, which is a two. And when we do that, that would get us four carbons on the left, 10 hydrogens on the left, 13 times two, 13 halves times two is 13. Once again, this is balanced, but we cannot leave it like that, right? Because we do have a fraction. So we do need to clear it. So just like before, we're gonna take this entire thing, we're gonna multiply it by two. And I'll just write it in the middle here. We will get two C4H10 plus 13 halves times two is 13. O2, two times uh, four is eight CO2. And lastly, five times two is 10 waters. And again, in this case, we should be balanced. We got eight carbons on the left, eight on the right, 20 hydrogens on the left, 20 on the right, and 26 oxygens on the left, 16 in the first one on the right, and 10 more give us 26, so we are balanced. Any questions on balancing equations? The goal is 
same number on each side, whole numbers, simplest set of whole numbers. Again, if you got polyatomic ions, keep them together. If you need to turn a number into a weird number, a fraction is sometimes in order, but you do have to clear the fraction. Any questions on any of the balancing part? Okay, now we talked about balancing equations. Let's talk about different types of reactions. There's many different ways you could classify reactions, even the same reaction. One big classification of reactions are what are referred to as redox reactions. Redox reactions are oxidation reduction reactions. When we talk about oxidation reduction reactions, basically oxidation means that something typically will lose electrons and reduction means that something will gain electrons. Sometimes people remember this, Leo the lion goes grr. Loss of electrons oxidation, gaining of electrons reduction. Some people are fond of the oil rig. Oxidizing is losing and reducing is gaining, whichever one you like, if none of them. By the way, how do you know if something's being oxidized or something's being reduced when you just kind of look at it? You could look at kind of the charge or what is sometimes referred to as the oxidation state. And you can use a very simple number line solution to figure that out. On a number line, there's zero. And to the right are usually positive numbers. To the left are negative numbers. When you lose electrons, you become more positive or more negative? Yeah, when you lose electrons, you become more positive, right? You got more protons and electrons. So if you find yourself looking at something that was on the left-hand side of the arrow to the right-hand side of the arrow, and that thing is becoming more positive, it is being oxidized. Vice versa, if you gain electrons, you have more negatives than positives, you become more negative. So if you're moving along the number line towards the negative side, that is something that has been reduced or went through reduction. You literally can for example, if you had iron on one side that went to iron three on the other side, you could just simply go, okay, my iron on the left started at zero. My iron on the right ended at plus three, which is moving in this direction, which means the iron is being oxidized. Yeah, in that case. So it's as simple as you can move one way or the other on the number line. It started actually at zero. It has no charge here. So anything by itself has no charge. And it ended up at plus three on the other side. So yeah, so if you just put a dot where you start at zero and you kind of head the arrow towards whatever the charge is on the other side, heading towards plus three, which would be moving to the right, it's becoming more positive and being oxidized. Yeah. So redox reactions are really a big classification of reactions. And if we look at this here, again, sodium by itself has really no charge. Chlorine by itself has no charge. As we talked about with naming, things really only get charged when they come together, which is what happens on the other side of the arrow here. On the other side of the arrow, the sodium now has a plus one charge. The chloride has a minus one charge. So again, if we just did our number line, and we looked at sodium, for example. Sodium started at zero on the left, ended at plus one, which means it's moving in the positive direction, which means sodium is getting oxidized. Sodium is being oxidized, it's losing electrons. If we look at the chlorine, chlorine started at zero and ended at negative one, which is moving in this direction, right? And that is becoming more negative. And the chlorine here is actually being reduced. They always occur together. If something gets oxidized, somebody else gets reduced because somebody gives away the electrons, somebody picks up the electrons. The good news about that is if you can figure out one, by default, the other thing is the opposite happening. So if you know what's being oxidized, the other guy has to be reduced. Or if you know which one's being reduced, the other guy has to be oxidized. So this is an example of a redox reaction. This is also an example of, as we will see, a synthesis reaction which is two things make one. So this is an oxidation. Here's another example. If we look at magnesium, zero, zero with the oxygen when they first start by themselves, not combined. When the magnesium and the oxygen come together, we end up with a plus two for the magnesium 
a minus two for the oxygen. Again, if we do our number line here, magnesium starting at zero on the left, ending at plus two means magnesium is being oxidized, right? And oxygen is starting at zero and ending at minus two, which is moving in this direction and it is being reduced. By the way, that is what we would expect to happen based on our conversations, right? Because metals typically are the ones that will lose electrons, right? It becomes cations and positively charged. So they typically are always the ones being oxidized when it's a metal and a non-metal coming together. Non-metals are typically the guys that will gain the electrons and become negatively charged. So whenever you have a metal and a non-metal come together, that is basically, um, you know, what's happening. The metal should always be the one oxidized, the non-metal is always the one that's being reduced. Any questions on that there? Now, we'll talk more about a couple other definitions of oxidation reduction when we get into organic chemistry, but there's a couple other definitions of oxidation, and that is when something gains electrons. I'm sorry, when it gains more oxygen going from left to right. So, Another definition of oxidation is the gaining of oxygen from reactants to products. It's also the loss of hydrogen from reactants to products is another definition of oxidation, along with the basic definition of losing electrons. So those are three different uh, uh, definitions of oxidation. In this chapter, we really will be looking at the electron aspect of it. In organic chemistry, we'll be looking at these type of oxidations. Reduction is the opposite. Reduction, again, is our gaining of electrons. It is the losing of oxygen as you go from reactants to products. And it is the gaining of hydrogen as you go from reactants to products. Again, in this chapter, the electrons is more what we're looking at. But if we look at it here, we can simply see that the sulfur here gain some oxygen as it went from left to right, which means it's going through oxidation. The copper here lost oxygen as it went from left to right. And that means it is going through reduction. We can look at the charge on the copper here on the left. What is the charge, by the way, on the CUO? The copper charge is plus two as the oxygen is minus two. Hydrogen is zero here. The copper on the right-hand side by itself is zero in terms of the charge. Hydrogen uh, plus one and minus two here. So if we look at the copper, by the way, the copper, if we did our number line, is starting at plus two, which would be over here. And it's actually ending at zero, which is heading in this direction, right? The more negative side, which means the copper is actually the one being reduced in this case. By default, that means the hydrogen is being oxidized. So again, you can determine one, the other guy is happening. You can see it with the hydrogen. Hydrogen started on the left as zero and ended at plus one, right? Which is going in this direction and being oxidized. Any questions on that? So when we talk about sort of redox reaction, oxidation reduction reaction, it's really a big umbrella of reactions that sort of fall underneath there, which we sometimes will classify reactions a little bit different than oxidation reactions or reduction reactions. Uh, sort of the big umbrella that some other reactions fall underneath there. So we'll get into that a little more. So let's talk about classifying reactions in a couple of different ways. There's really three reasons why a reaction takes place. One is a solid is formed, and that is sometimes referred to as a precipitate reaction or precipitate being made, PPD. Water being formed is another reason why a reaction takes place and the transfer of electrons, which is basically what happens in our redox reactions. So in our redox reactions are basically transfer of electrons. These other two occur in another big umbrella of reactions which are commonly referred to as double displacement reactions. We're gonna talk about those in just a second. But double displacement reactions are really like a big umbrella of reactions that you can more specifically classify another way underneath. 
redox reactions, again, sort of a big umbrella of reactions. And underneath that umbrella, you can more specifically classify each reaction in a specific way. So let's talk about those different classification. The first type of reaction is a synthesis or combination reaction. And a synthesis or combination reaction has this general formula, A plus B makes A and B. Basically you take two things and you make one thing is basically what you do. So if you see two things on the left-hand side of the arrow, one thing on the right, that is your classic synthesis or combination reaction. These are two things that make one thing. That is your classic uh, combination reaction, two things that make one thing synthesis combination reaction. You may also again recognize that guy on the bottom there and I'll just write it like this. Not balanced, but bad me. But this is also a synthesis combination. This is still the redox reaction that we were just talking about, I think a second ago. The big classification is this is a redox reaction where we have the oxidation of our sodium and the reduction of our chlorine a more specific classification of that reaction is one that is known as a synthesis or combination reaction. So you could classify the same reaction multiple ways, depending on sort of what you're looking at. I think in your lab, they look at this as synthesis or combination. I don't think they really get into the redox part of it, but again, redox is the big classification. Most people would probably classify this reaction as a synthesis or combination. Any question on that one there? Basically, the reverse of that reaction is a decomposition reaction. In a decomposition reaction, we start with one thing and we make like two or more things. So synthesis or combination, we put it together. Decomposition, we start with one thing and we break it apart, basically. So they're kind of opposites of each other. If you run an electrical current over water, it will break apart into H2 and O2. So one thing breaks apart into two things, classic decomposition reaction. Mercury two oxide here, heat it up, you'll get some mercury and some oxygen, mercury liquid and some oxygen there. And that is one thing making two things. Again, it may not appear to you, but this is also again under the big umbrella of redox. The mercury here on the left has a plus two charge. The oxygen on the left has a minus two charge. These guys are both zero on this side because they are by themselves, not combined with anything else. So again, if we just follow our number line here, mercury started at plus two, which would be over here and ended at zero, which means mercury is actually being reduced, right? Becoming more negative. The oxygen actually started at minus two, which would be over here and ended at zero, which means it's going to the positive side and the oxygen here is being oxidized. So big classification of this type of reaction would be a redox reaction. More specific classification would be a decomposition reaction. Most people, again, would just straight up call it a decomposition reaction, but it really is a redox reaction. Why that's important is what we really have happening here in this one and the previous one is a transfer of electrons, which is why a reaction takes place. Those electrons are being transferred. It's what allows this reaction really to occur. Any questions on those two classifications? Another type of classification is a single displacement reaction or single replacement reaction. Sometimes people will call it as well, either way. And in a single replacement reaction, we basically have two things that could occur. You could have something that is by itself, no charge, like a metal. And then you have an ionic compound, so a positive and negative guy. Now, if this is a metal, when it is by itself, it has no charge. But when metals do get charges, they become positive or negatively charged. They do. So what happens in this reaction, if this guy is a metal, it will come in and actually kick out the positive guy. When it comes in to kick out the positive guy, it will then become positively charged and make a new ionic compound where it now has a charge. The guy that it kicks out will come out by itself with no charge. This is a redox reaction, but again, it is referred to as a single replacement reaction. You could also do this exact same thing with a non-metal. 
And if you had a non-metal by itself, it has no charge. This guy would be an ionic compound. A non-metal, when it does get a charge, becomes negatively charged, which means when it comes in, it's going to kick out actually the negative guy in this case. When it does so, we will create a new ionic compound where that guy will now become negatively charged. The guy that gets kicked out will become kicked out with no charge. And that is also what is referred to as a single replacement reaction. In order for this reaction to actually take place, whatever is coming in, needs to be more reactive than what it is replacing. That means if we see A come in to kick out B, A would be more reactive than B. If we see A come in and it actually doesn't have a reaction take place, that means A is less reactive. If we look here at the zinc plus some hydrochloric acid, zinc has no charge here when it's by itself. Hydrochloric acid is basically a positive and negative guy. The zinc is going to come in and kick out the hydrogen. When hydrogen comes out by itself, it is H2, which is hydrogen gas. Has no charge, by the way. You would see bubbles. Hydrogen gas would be bubbling right about now. Your zinc would be disappearing or dissolving. It's at that point when the zinc comes in, it gets a plus two charge, and the chloride obviously has a minus one charge. And that means in this particular reaction, if you saw it occur, which you would see it occur, that means that zinc would be more reactive than hydrogen in this case, because it was able to kick it out and you saw the bubbles. This is a classic single replacement reaction. If you tried to do this exact same reaction with copper and the hydrochloric acid, you would get no reaction. And that is because Copper is less reactive than hydrogen, and it actually would not kick out the hydrogen in this case. So if you actually do a single replacement reaction, nothing occurs. That means whatever was by itself is less reactive than what it was supposed to replace. If you do a single re a replacement reaction, you actually see a reaction occur. That means whatever was by itself is more reactive than what it was replacing, and the reaction did take place. So this is a single replacement reaction. It is also still under the umbrella of redox because if we look just for example at the zinc, zinc started at zero and ended at plus two, which means the zinc is being oxidized. The hydrogen here is actually being reduced in this case. Hydrogen is going from plus one to zero on the other side heading to the left and becoming reduced in this case. So again, big classification under the big umbrella of redox. Most people, again, would use the more specific classification of a single replacement reaction. Any questions on that there? And that is how you recognize it. You should have basically one thing by itself, uncombined, no charge. And you should have an ionic compound, positive, negative guy, and that's classically how you could recognize that that is a single replacement reaction. The next type of reaction is what is referred to as a precipitation reaction. And a precipitation reaction falls under the big umbrella of double displacement reactions. And really double displacement reactions have this general thing. It's AB plus CD. These are both ionic compounds. And that's clearly how you recognize this type of reaction. And basically in a double displacement reaction, the two positive guys switch partners is basically what happens. So the A will end up with the D and the C will end up with the B. So when I look at this reaction on the bottom, how do I know it's double displacement? I see potassium chromate, that's a positive negative guy. I see barium nitrate, that's a positive negative guy. That's pretty much all I need to see. That is going to be a double displacement reaction. Double displacement reaction is the big umbrella for which a precipitation reaction falls underneath. As these guys switch partners, the potassium ends up with the nitrate, as we see over here. The barium ends up with the chromate, as we see over here. The result of that is we form a solid. And a solid is what is referred to as a precipitate, which is why it's called a precipitation reaction. So one result of a double displacement reaction is a solid is formed. 
Both of these guys are solutions. You take two solutions, mix them together, and you get the solid that actually forms. And that is what is referred to as a precipitation reaction. Big classification is a double displacement reaction. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So how do we figure out what we get on the other side? Well, you just want to look at these guys and take the basic units. So this guy is really a K plus and a chromate. This guy is really a barium with a plus two charge and a nitrate. This is the type of situation where if you're not given the right-hand side, you want to make sure you get those formulas correct, like we were talking about with, with balancing, which means when you take this guy and you take this guy and put them together, Regardless that there's a two here, you just want to put it together correctly like you're doing nomenclature. Plus one and minus one gives you the correct formula over here, which is KNO3. When you put this guy together with this guy, you got a plus two and a minus two, which you just need one of each of those, which is why we get this formula. So sometimes when people are given this equation and you're like asked to write the stuff on this side and balance it, people will start putting extra twos in there because they want to balance and kind of write the formula at the same time. So remember, you want to write the formulas correctly first, then go back and fix the coefficients to balance it second. Otherwise, you will run out of the wrong equations when you do it. So again, as I talked about, this is really a double displacement reaction, which is the big umbrella for which this is classified and it's basically really just our positive guy switching partners on the other side. So for example, if I had silver nitrate plus some sodium chloride and I wanted to write what's on the other side. First off, when I look at this, silver nitrate is a positive negative guy positive negative, which tells me this is a double displacement reaction, which means positive guy here will go with the negative here. Positive will go with the negative over here. When I look at silver nitrate, that's made up of two things. It is made up of a silver ion and a nitrate ion. When I look at sodium chloride, that is made up of a sodium ion and a chloride ion. I'm going to first put these guys together, which means plus one, minus one, gives me the proper formula of silver chloride, which happens to be the solid that forms here. And when I take this guy, which is sodium, and I minus one over here, I just need one of each of those, and that would give us our nitrate. And this would be a precipitation reaction because you did make a solid. It's also a double displacement reaction um, because we have that double exchange occurring. Any questions on that? So if you have to predict what goes on the other side, basic units, put them together like you're doing nomenclature, and then go back and balance the equation at the very end. This reaction here is a strong acid with a strong base. And whenever you take a strong acid with a strong base, they're sometimes called acid-base neutralization reactions, but they really are double displacement reactions. This is a positive negative guy. That's a positive negative guy. Positive guy is going to switch to the negative, positive to the negative. When you take H plus and OH minus, that is where we get water from. So that is where the water comes from. The OH minus from the base, which is the KOH, and the H plus from the acid. So basically this guy and this guy is where the water comes from. This is a salt that is sometimes referred to, and that's a fancy word for an ionic compound. And that's the result of the leftover two things. We got a potassium that basically has a plus one charge. And we got a chloride that has a minus one charge. So when these guys come together, we get potassium chloride. This is an acid-base neutralization reaction. Whenever you take a strong acid and a strong base together, you make water is basically what's happening here, which if you remember is the other driving force for a reaction to make water. And that's why it's sometimes called an acid-base neutralization reaction because basically the overall thing that's actually being made when you put this together is it is the H plus from the acid coming together with the OH minus from the base to make water is basically the main reaction that's happening when you take hydrochloric acid and potassium hydroxide, strong acid, strong base together, you're actually just making water is really what is happening in that particular case. 
any questions on that? So this is also a double displacement reaction, more specifically classified as a uh, acid-base neutralization reaction. The last type of reaction is a combustion reaction. And most of the time when people think about combustion reactions, they think about organic combustion reactions. And the very simple concept of an organic combustion reaction is you got O2 on the left, CO2 and water is always formed. If you start with something that is organic, which means carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, basically. So if you're starting with something that's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and you react it with O2, you will always make CO2 and water. It's what happens when you light a Bunsen burner. It's what happens when you light your barbecue, right? Propane and all that kind of stuff. It's based combustion reaction, combustion engines. You know, if you got one of those, um, that's basically what happens. Now, there is a more generic definition of a combustion reaction, um, which I think your lab talks about and others talk about. A really more generic definition of a combustion reaction essentially is any reaction where there's O2 involved. So if you see O2 on the left-hand side, you technically could call it a combustion reaction, but probably nine times out of 10, most people think of a combustion reaction, they think of this one, which is the organic combustion reaction. What that means is essentially, if you remember that reaction we saw earlier where we had magnesium plus oxygen made magnesium oxide. This technically, is a synthesis reaction, yes, two things make one thing. This is also a redox reaction, right? Electrons being transferred. And technically speaking, because there's oxygen, you could classify it as a combustion reaction. So you can classify the same reaction multiple ways, sort of depending on what you're looking at. Um, any questions on how to classify those reactions? So just to summarize here, uh, to finish it up, um, where do I go? I'll go here, I guess. There is really two big umbrellas. There is the redox umbrella, and underneath the redox reactions, you have a synthesis reaction or a combination reaction. You have a decomposition reaction. You have a single replacement reaction. And you really have a combustion reaction. So all those more specific classifications of reactions that you could call something a synthesis, a decomposition, a single replacement, a combustion. Ultimately, what is all happening in those type of reactions are and electrons are being transferred, which are redox reactions. That's why they're really underneath the big umbrella. The other big umbrella is double displacement. And underneath the double displacement, you have your precipitation reaction, which is where we form a precipitate, which is the second reason why a reaction takes place. And you have acid-base reactions. which is basically where water is formed. And really those are the three reasons why a reaction takes place. Electrons being transferred in one of these type of reactions, a solid is being made in a precipitation reaction and water is being made in an acid base reaction. And those are really the three main reasons why we do have reactions that take place. Again, for your lab, I think they, they stick to these classifications, synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, combustion. And I think they just call it do double displacement, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think they get a neutralization, badly written neutralization reaction. Any questions on ways to classify reactions or balancing equations? All right, we will lay it out.